We are going live. My history is I, I'm, I used to be a phys ed teacher, and grade 10 girls ruined me out of that profession really fast. Uh, I couldn't understand, and this is something that you'll understand, because as, as, as teachers, the, I found I was better teaching things that I wasn't good at. So math, for instance, I'm an awesome math teacher because I hated math. Grade 11 math was the best two years of my life. And so I understand why you don't get it. Phys ed, I couldn't understand why somebody wouldn't just stand out on the field and get hit by the basketball or get hit by the football. You get marks because you're standing up there participating. I just couldn't understand why you would come to phys ed class with shoes, the wrong shoes, the wrong dress in order to participate, doesn't want to participate, oh, I have the problems, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that. There's so many excuses that I finally said, well, I really don't want to do this. So I ended up going into the art world at EDPN High School here in the city for 10 years as the high school art teacher. Loved the job. In 95, I built my first online art gallery. Someone from the government said they would give me a matching grant to start an online art gallery. I put a proposal in thinking there's no way they're going to be able to give me a matching grant for this and they actually came back and said, yeah, go for it. And so, yeah, yeah, basically with a crank on the side. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and not knowing anything about building web pages or anything like that. So I had to reverse engineer web pages in order to figure out how to do HTML so I could edit it enough to turn it into an art gallery. And so I started to do that, started to sell some of my own art online. And then um, at that time, the principal at, at the end said, well, would you be willing to teach a computer class? Because you obviously have some background in it. And I'm like, sure. So I, and I always tell a story that I ended up being a computer teacher for that year and became an online teacher for that year because of an overhead projector. And I didn't want to leave the kids unsupervised in a computer classroom because you know what sort of nightmare that causes. So I said, okay, then uh, just a minute. And I put it on a web page really fast and said, there's your notes, write down the notes. And don't worry about the overhead projector. So the kids said, so how'd you do that? I said, well, I put it on a web page. And they said, well, if it's on a web page and it's going to be on the web, what the heck are we writing it down for? I said, well, that's a good point. <laughs> so then after that, every day I put my notes online. And then near the end of the semester, I started to put the grades online. I put a test online and then gave the kids their grades and, the and their parents could go look at it. So it was a really uh, rustic first online course in our division. And so at that time, the principal, who was a friend of mine, said, listen, I'd like to give you twice the number of kids. I said, well, why? He says, well, because the online, not the online, but the computer class is really popular. We don't have enough computers. And I said, well, if you give me twice the number of kids, what do you want me to do, double them up? He goes, no, send half of them home. He says, because I hear everything you're doing is online, so then let the kids do it online. So can you do that? I said, sure. So then away they went, and I had, uh, at that time, I had about 25 kids or 30 kids in the class, and it got bigger to about 40 the one year, and half the class left and just worked in the library or whatever, and then that was getting into around 1990, or 99, excuse me, and they said, now would you like to try it with another subject? To which I said, not especially, but I will actually explore the possibility of doing that. I really liked the art class, and I didn't want to get into more computer classes. So I said, listen, I will, uh, I will certainly explore it. So we, I explored it and then sent a proposal back into the division. And the division, after a lot of discernment and all that other stuff, came back and said, would you be willing to start an online school? I said, yeah, but I can't teach science or any of those other ones. What can I do? And he says, I'll give you three experts, content experts. They won't be very computer literate, one of them was, but the other two were not. And they said to them, see if you can start an online school. And so that first year, we ended up with 300 and something kids right away came in and were very excited about doing it. And by the time we finished, 13 years later, we had about 1,600 kids in the cyber school. So are these kids the kids that are going to the school on a regular basis, like face to face, but then they're taking some of their courses online, or are the kids from the communities? Or right. The, the way it started was, um, specifically to give an option to the students who were in our school division. It wasn't meant to be a, a system that would replace the face-to-face -face school or would be a method of offering courses outside of our division. What we found really fast was that lots and lots of kids wanted it. So every year for the first six years, we doubled in size every single year, more and more kids writing more classes, and the demand was always there, and the kids were driving the demand to it. Then, um, because it was the students within our 
schools, it became an issue because now we're teaching kids 11 classes and 12 classes rather than the standard 10 or whatever you expect a normal high school student to take because some students would like to take industrial arts, for instance, and because they were banned French students, wouldn't be able to fit it into their schedule. Well, now what they would do is they would take one of their classes online, which would free up a time in the work day, the school day, so they could take another class. And we schedule for people who pass all the way through. So if he was in grade 10 math class, for instance, and he failed grade 10 math, it would put him a whole year behind based on the schedule because we wouldn't offer the same class again until the following year. And so that's really detrimental to the students. So we had a lot of demand for those type of students who wanted to get back into the normal flow. And then the other ones that came out of the woodworks were the kids that just didn't function in a normal school, which we never knew existed because you never saw them. We didn't have an option, right? And so all, suddenly you had a student who said, I was bullied last year, I've been homeschooled, I didn't want to be homeschooled, and um, I'm here now and I'd like to take it online. And I'm thinking, so go back to the school. No, I have a phobia, I won't go back to the schools. Hockey players who were playing hockey full time and weren't here would go away for three months or four months to play for a, a hockey team. Then their team would lose out, they'd come back, and their schooling would be all messed up because they would weren't getting the same education if they were in the States or someplace else and their programs didn't match and it was just a schmozzle for those guys so they came online. The, the students who took the, uh, had a baby for instance when they're 16, 17 years old they would fall out of the school system and would never get their high school sometimes. Mm -hmm. The person who didn't graduate after three or four years it's really difficult for someone 19, 20 years old to step into a school. Like you come back at 20 years old and go into a grade 12 classroom because you're missing two classes and see how popular you are then. And then we started to see some other applications for it. For instance, um, credit recovery. So if a student was in a grade 10 math class and received 60% on five of the units and two of the units they failed, their mark may be low enough that they wouldn't pass. But they only didn't understand two of the units. So in the past system without credit recovery, that student would have to take the whole class over again. Well, now they have the option to just take the two units that they missed, upgrade those to the point where they have a passing grade, and then they can move on to the next grade. Yeah. So that was a real neat system that worked. Because it was flexible, students could decide that I'm into basketball, and I'm really serious about basketball, and I'm playing basketball for six hours a day or whatever. They could decide to take less classes in school and then catch up later on or work ahead. So a student who was taking the 12 classes in a, in a year could actually take half a semester off to go water skiing down in the States. And so a lot of those, the flexibility that came with the cyber school and allowed people to think of some flexible scheduling was a very popular and something that people were really interested in doing. The offshoot for me as an educator was that I learned a lot about what works and what doesn't work in an online environment. And so all my um, research that I'm doing now and what I've take, taken in the business world is the, that there's a, a theory out there that if you take your content and you create it in such a way that there's enough interaction and engagement with it, you can take the instructor out of the equation a little bit more than you could in a high school or in an elementary school. Because in an adult world, people are told that they have to do something and they actually have to pass. And so a lot of the things that we did in the high school and in the elementary school was the uh, motivation. And it, it, a light came on really fast when I was doing an in-service in, in a military institution. And they were thinking about doing some online classes. And I asked, so what are you going to do for motivation? How are you going to get the, your people involved? He goes, no, I tell them to do it. They'll do it. They're soldiers. They do what they're told. Our adult program, when, we, when it started to grow, we found out that our adults were super, super successful because of their need to do it was very strong mm -hmm. and so uh, when they came online we had students who decided they needed chemistry never got in high school but decided they wanted to go back to nursing they would finish the chemistry course in two weeks three weeks and a normal person would take like four months five months and because they needed it fast and they needed it quick then it, when you take some of that motivation away and you don't have to spend your time doing a lot of that within the class then the teacher who eliminated themselves as a sage on the stage goes away and you have this person who is standing there and is just a facilitator and helping the person answer the questions that they have, it makes it so much easier to do the training. And so then that's where this whole group of trainers understand that, that when you're putting things together, adults 
do it for a different reason than the the high school kids. That's a that's a fundamental battle of education. I think even in the adult education world, I've seen you know, where the the, the the instructor and facilitator still takes too much center stage because right. they think that or they spend too much time on the motivational side. Where most of the time, unless there's certain circumstances, most of the time the people, the adults are there. They're gonna they're there. Yeah. And they're gonna do it. Now you might fail and getting them interested, right. but they're going to be there. They're there to start. Right. And they've been told they have to do it. In some cases, yeah, in a lot of cases. Or they're self-motivated because right. they want to go to nursing or they want to go back to education or they this is a requirement of their job. So they're not. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a really interesting watershed because there are some people who are told they have to do it. Right. And then the question is why do they have to do it? So I think about compliance training, for example, people with a lot of Compliance training is like watching the paint dry. And people will go to it and organizationally sometimes the issue is as long as we can show that they sat there for six hours. We checked off the box. We checked okay. off the box. And that culture is out there. So there that's where you know, that motivation has to come back. Right. And, to it. and that's the other side of that. Yeah, you have to be there. And my butt's in the seat. Right. But I gotta tell you, I've been brain surfing somewhere else. Right. And so, so the statement that you just made is the reason why in the training world there's been a big uptake on the online learning. For instance, the one that you're talking about, you watch paint dry. If I can do it online, then what I can do is I can start the video and I can go away, I can make dinner, I can come back and then ask the questions. Because it's mastery learning, I can do the questions over and over again. Sooner or later, I'm going to pass it well enough that I got my mark and away I go. What? Mm -hmm. We are trying to, with the new business model that I've brought, is that we're trying now to make it engaging enough that the content engages all the different types of learning styles. And because it's flexible enough, if you're in there and you just have to complete the material, the assessment model is such that you still assess whether or not you know the knowledge, and that's where tests sometimes become a, um, less of an assessment model and more of a teaching tool and the mastering learning thing comes in. So if someone doesn't want to read all the content, you can actually learn the material in the course simply by doing the tests over and over again because as you do the test, that marks it for you, gives you some feedback and says, no, this is wrong. Sooner or later, you're going to understand that content, at least 70% of it, in order to get the mark. Or you're going to keep guessing C all the way down and hoping that that comes up often enough. But it can be learned as, as a teaching tool. And so all the research that I've done in the past now has talked about the three different types of um, interaction. So you have the teacher to the student, you have the student to the student, and then you have the content. And because the content can be flexible enough and hit enough different people, it is possible to remove the face-to-face -face teacher. Now as a teacher I would never ever say that because in a K-12 to environment that's not where you want to go. But in an adult stage we now exist in a world where the teacher doesn't exist. We have all the information we need right here and when we come up with a question, this is where people go looking. In fact, we, we now have a word called Google. And so we say Google it. Everybody says, well, how are you going to figure that out? I'm going to Google it. We don't go looking for the expert anymore. The first place we go is right here. For instance, the other day I'm sick. What do I do? I Google it and find out I'm dying of cancer. <laughs> but it's not true, but that's what everybody does. It must just kill doctors because everybody comes in and has self-diagnosed themselves online and have all the information and then they come back and go, oh, my God, I'm dying of cancer. No, you're not. You've got a cold. <laughs> and so those type of things are the world that we exist in now. And so the company that we've developed now is a knowledge transfer process. So my boss, for instance, we started this company now a month and a half ago. We started with our new model. My boss is in a project management through and through. He is uh, the guru of it. He gets so excited. I've never seen anybody so passionate about project management. He can stand in front of anybody and sell it to you and you would walk away saying, hey, project management's great and all that other stuff. Except for the fact that if you want to hire him to stand in front of you, it's going to cost you a hell of a lot of money for your company to be able to do that. You have to send all your employees there. He's going to stand in front of you for eight hours a day. You need to listen to him. He's going to tell you stuff you already know so you don't have the flexibility to say, I know that and go on to the next chapter like you do online. You have to be, sit in that chair and I don't know about you guys, but if I sit for eight hours, I go squirrely in a chair and then you have to do that for four days and during that four days you're, no, you're serving no function for your actual company. And so what we did is we took all his expertise and we're putting it online. So now we can also then offer it a lot cheaper because 
he's not attached per se as the facilitator. He's not the instructor and the only source of information. Now all the content is there and we have a facilitator that will walk, check in every so often to answer the questions that may be technical questions. And we found that on the online environment, when we were teaching online in the K-12 schools, after about five years of teaching, the teacher doesn't teach content anymore. They teach technical issues. Someone doesn't know how to hand in an essay. They don't know how to do this because what you do is you keep repairing the, the content until you get to the stage where it's answered all the questions. So you go through your tests, you look, and if someone has missed this point completely, everybody fails this one question. It's because you didn't write the content very well. Do a video for it, do an audio file, do a game attached to that concept, and sooner or later you're going to have a course that's strong enough that it'll teach kids how to do it without having a, a sage on the stage in front of them. So it definitely works for adults. And so that's the model that we've now brought into the, the workplace. And so the first course that we've got up and running is the project management course. Now the philosophy that we have is we have a structure now that will allow anybody in the world to come to us who's a subject matter expert and say, I would like to create an online course and we will apply all the 13 years of experience that I had online and all the experts that I had help me because I didn't do it alone. There's a whole pile of teachers that help. They are willing to help people build online material based on a certified teacher who knows how to develop courses. And that's a very unique scenario that normally doesn't happen. What happens is you have somebody who's writing the course design, is really good at course design, but doesn't know how to teach. And so now what I'm bringing to the table is a whole pile of people that have that expertise that may be able to do it. And so that's the business model. Now, is it going to work? I hope so. <laughs> but we won't know until we start rolling these out. But you can offer the training and a major amount of savings for most people who are in the training industry because that model of bringing everybody together still has to exist for some concepts, but a lot of stuff can be done across the line. And when people say, well, you can't teach everything online, heck, we had a phys ed class online, and it worked just fine. Like, click that mouse, take your heart rate. Click that mouse. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like that, but it, you can actually, if you're creative enough, you can actually teach anything you want online using the different tools that are available out there. And we're getting better at it, like the health industry, for instance, now with their robotics and the connection between the doctor and robotics and the distance, all those type of things are going to get so exciting in the next little while where if I go see a doctor, now what I do is I have to sit down and remind him first off who I am, what my history is, and then here's what I'm working on now and what my concern is. What you should do before you go into the doctors is you should be able to go on to something online and go, here's an issue that I have a problem with, da 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 da, -da. here's my history, and it should all be done beforehand, or it should be in your digital health records that it automatically pulls the stuff up that's pertinent. And then when you go to the doctor, the doctor goes, yeah, the diagnosis is correct, here's your pills, now get out. And we wouldn't have this uh, the weight issue that we have now because I sit down with a doctor, it takes them a half hour to get up to speed before we even start because he's so busy he doesn't have time to read the file and all that stuff so he starts asking me again so what are you in here for? How old are you? Do you have heart issues in your family? No, not at all. <laughs> Keel over. <laughs> so those type of things uh, I think our technology is going to be so exciting as we go down that path so I'm so excited to be able to bring some of the training into the training world and hopefully into the health world and hopefully in the business and then always an educator. You said this was a story and I wish I but there's a bank that's introduced voice, voice recognition for security. Oh, that's kind of interesting. So when you call and you say, we dial or whatever, and then you say, hi, my name is Ari, uh, I'm gonna, and they have a sentence you're supposed to say. It validates all of your information. So by the time you're done the call and you get to the agent, right. they already know who you are. They pull up your history. It's awesome. Your account number comes up. You know, none of this typing your yeah. account number or anything like that. And they get right to the issue. That's all. They're talking about the savings. I think they said about two minutes per call, which is huge. Well, when you, when you think about the the lean, and that's what lean's all about, like the, the hospitals and the, the way they're spending the money, as far as I understand it. And I think it's going to be an interesting time in the next little while for them to try and hit their target in 2017 of removing all the wait lists and all that other stuff. That's a huge task. And one of the things that the health industry, and, from, and again, this is my opinion, is very good at is coming up with processes, but the knowledge transfer as you pass things down has always been done in the style of training the trainer 
So if we're a group of people and we're going to say, okay, this is what we're going to do to make it better. So we're going to go tell all the nurses everything we need to know. So here's what you need to tell them. Here's what you need to tell them. Here's what you need to tell them. And you go tell your trainers and then, you know, that, that game where you go, hey, if somebody's here and he goes in the next year, by the time he gets down to this guy, he's not even talking about the same thing. And I think the digital world, because it re removes the distance and the time issue, means you can have one single expert who can bring things to the population and that knowledge transfer can be so seamless that you should be able to do a much better job of knowledge transfer. The transfer, but the, the, isn't the content going to suffer if we, if we eliminate the amount of people involved in, in the delivery of it? Like we, have, we have one expert telling all the healthcare professionals in Saskatchewan how to do something, what if he's wrong or she's wrong? What if that person makes a mistake yep. and there's no one, you know, Paying attention to fix it. Now we've taught everybody very efficiently the wrong thing, which yeah. I think is a, it's, it really brings up the whole planning, and that would be part of the project management. Is that that the and, and that's the same. I mean, we've all taken that kind of stuff where where you do something, it's the planning that should take all the time, the execution, yeah. the short part. That's where it's really going to have to be wrapped up. Of course, and it's the whole model that the military has. Like my dad was in the military for years, and when you think about it, if you have a general who's telling you go shoot everybody in that village and because you're a soldier you follow the rules and away you go, we're hoping that that doesn't happen in a process. You still expect people to filter information and apply it in what they figure is the best method of them doing it because they're professionals. It's just that the too often things are filtered down and there isn't this center core. And the, and the only example I can give you of that is when we roll out new curriculum in Saskatchewan, for instance. In our division, grade 9 curriculum came out, grade 9 math. Very interesting. Trying to get people to change their whole culture of the way they teach math. What we did is we built an online course built by someone who understand the process, understood the new course, was part of the writing of the course. So when they created that course, then they pass it off to the teacher. So now you have, here you have a good copy of that. That person then has the master copy of the way they should teach it. That doesn't mean they teach it exactly but at least they have something to fall back on, rather than, oh, here, by the way, here's a grade 9 curriculum. You as a teacher have to have it up in September, and we're giving it to you in June. Good luck. Figure out how you're going to start teaching that in September. And by the way, here's a science one, by the way, and here's an English one. So as a teacher, then you're stuck there trying to figure out how to do that. And I have a feeling that's the same thing that's going to happen in the health industry and happens in our industries as well, like any business that you're involved in. When I'm dispersing my information within my office, the same thing applies. I can sit there and I can talk like I'm doing here, but if you didn't understand something that happened here, the fact that it's being recorded online means you can go back and check it and check it and check it until you get it right. That is a very valuable tool in the end because I can go back over this whole thing and what I've done with a lot of my videos on when I'm doing this kind of stuff is chop them up and break them into the sound bites. This is really important. This is really good. Oh boy, I said that wrong. That was a real stupid statement. Cut that out. Put some music behind that one and crank the music really loud when I made that stupid statement. Those type of things. You can edit the video to, to say what you wanted to say. And so the, the ability to digitally save information in a central location will save us lots of time of training and to move, to move things forward as far as changing culture and changing the way people think. Because the process we have now in a province the size that we have with only a million people makes it really difficult. And we have difficulty with things like putting doctors in rural communities. Technology can eliminate that. If you have an actual questionnaire, because most diagnosis is done by, do you have a sore throat? Yes. On to the next path. Do you, uh, have, you, do you have problems doing this? Da, da, da. And a lot of the questions that the doctor asks me and uh, uh, the diagnosis when I walk in there is a yes or no answer. And, and you could break all of that down. And a lot of that can be done before you even get to the doctor. Now, the problem is exactly what you said. I think I'm dying of cancer. <laughs> this is where you go because my throat's just killing me. It's like razor blades. Well, explain to me. And the doctor has a very good intuitive method of uh, finding out whether or not you're really dying of this uh, swallowing or is it just you being a big wimp. And so doctors have to bring that in. Will technology get to the point where the AI is smart enough to make those diagnoses and be able to do it? I think they will in time. But if they don't, you can do this kind of stuff where the doctor says, okay, talk to me. And then they can intervene, but the information on the right-hand side shows you the history and the questions they've answered and all that other stuff. That could be a very cool tool. And not having to put a doctor in every small community around Saskatchewan when there's only a million people. So 
there's a lots of opportunities from the way I'm looking at it that could be very exciting in the future. Will we get there? I don't know. I just think it's exciting to be part of that. And education, I will always miss because there's nothing better than sitting in front of a class of 30 kids and having them give you that, oh yeah, that's cool, I got that. But that's part of education. <laughs> that's the end of my broadcast, kids. We're going to go into some serious talk.